Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the Connecting Vital Events Registration and Gender Equality Conference, the Converge Conference. Um, before I start, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. My name is Muntasir Kamal, and I'm the program leader for the Maternal and Child Health Program here at the International Development Research Center, which also houses the Center of Excellence for Civil Registration and Vital uh, Statistics Systems. Uh, and it's our pleasure to have you here today. Um, I will be your master of ceremonies for the event for today and tomorrow. And I would like to thank you all for coming. Uh, many are joining us online as well, so uh, throughout the conference, and I welcome all of you uh, here today. Many of you have traveled from different cities, countries, and continents. Uh, and um, for those who were here uh, two years ago for the first conference, for this conference two years ago, we have uh, representatives from new continents and new uh, countries in this meeting. We have representatives this time from Latin America, the Middle East, uh, and uh, uh, we would like to welcome them, uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Europe, North America. So we would like to welcome everyone um, and uh, encourage you to participate fully and uh, uh, hopefully benefit from the conference. Um, I'd also like to recognize our co-organizers for this event. Uh, 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 while we, everyone worked hard, we have two uh, uh, exceptional partners that also worked very hard with us, the United Nations uh, uh, Population Fund and Open Data Watch. And you'll hear uh, more later during the conference on, their, uh, on how we have been collaborating with them on the last, uh, for the last few years. Um, they have been uh, an integral uh, uh, partners to our work, and we thank them very much for their uh, uh, collaboration, wonderful collaboration. Je voudrais uh, remercier nos co-organisateurs. Co I would like to thank uh, our co-organiser, the UN Fund for Population and Open Data Watch, that uh, throughout uh, the uh, years have collaborated with us on this uh, um, exceptional project. Ago, uh, at our first global meeting, Making the Invisible Visible. I think many of you would recognize that we have uh, all collectively uh, succeeded to some extent in making the invisible visible uh, in terms of gender issues and CRVS. Uh, we have, <clears throat> nous avons uh, discuté uh, d'état, uh, l'état de... We have uh, discussed about uh, the state of CRVAS. We have identified priorities. Uh, and collectively, we have recognized the critical impact uh, of uh, the CRVAS uh, system on uh, the well-being of women and children. We have also had, uh, sorry, we had in, the, uh, in that conference, we agreed on a way forward, some commitments and action uh, items from that conference. And um, we'll see, uh, you'll, we'll be discussing during this, the course of these two days, how much of this have we achieved, in what way, and what is the way forward um, for, for us. Uh, these are uh, really a very uh, um, impressive uh, progress. There's very imp impressive progress since the last two years, but there's a long way to go. As uh, our friend Shaida keeps reminding us, if we were walking the past five years, we should be running for the next 10 years to achieve the SDGs. Um, without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome the uh, I welcome IDRC's Vice President for Progr of Programs and Partnership, Dominique Charon, to offer some opening remarks. Uh, prior to her role as Vice President, Dominique Charon was the Director of IDRC's Agriculture and Environment Program, where she supervised research focused on into increasing agricultural productivity and food security, reducing vulnerability to climate change, and protecting the public against infectious, infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases, among other things. So, Dominique, please. Good morning, bonjour tout le monde. Welcome. Um, I'm going to speak in both languages, both English and French. Il y a la, simul la traduction simultanée. We have simultaneous interpretation. Sets if you need them. C'est un grand plaisir uh, 
de vous accueillir au CRDI, au Centre de recherche pour le développement international. We're happy to welcome you at RDRC to help advance inclusion and the well-being of women, children, and marginalized people within our society through uh, CRVS. Why is this issue so important? Talking about Miriam, to help illustrate why these issues are so important. Miriam is Syrian. At the urging of her family several years ago and pregnant with her third child, she fled the horrors of the war in Syria uh, with her mother-in-law and her two kids, leaving behind her husband and many other members of her extended family. She's now living in a camp in Turkey, safe, um, and ha gave birth uh, to a beautiful baby daughter uh, in, in the camp in Turkey. In addition to all the challenges that she faces as a displaced person, as a person dealing with all of the trauma of war, as a, a, a woman separated from her family and her husband, uh, with young children in tow, she fears that her daughter may be stateless. She cannot register the birth of her baby and could not register the birth of her baby in Turkey without her fa the father of the baby being present and signing the birth registration. Without this registration, um, her child may not be able to obtain a Syrian identity card or passport for her daughter when she returns to uh, Syria. This lack of registration of the birth presents substantial obstacles for her daughter, certainly in the near term, but throughout her life if she can't resolve this. She will not be able to easily obtain health insurance. She will not be able to easily enroll in schools. She will struggle as she becomes an adult to obtain a bank account. She will not be able to potentially get a job or an apartment, any number of things that we take for granted. Miriam should be able to register her daughter's birth on her own. All countries should be struggle, striving to make sure that births are registered where they happen, when they happen, irrespective of the presence of one or the other parent. Registering and counting people through their life cycle, birth, and also other important events like marriage and death, at a minimum, has a profound impact on people's lives. Proof of registration can be life changing and we can only imagine how Miriam's daughter will have a much easier way of emerging from the trauma of being born in a refugee camp if she has access to a number of these services that she will need that identity and registration for. When a child's birth is not registered, this child is invisible for the state and will face several obstacles throughout her life, as I have stated for Miriam and her child. Other vital events are similarly fundamental to the state's capacity to provide for its people. Countries rely on these data from vital events, registration, birth, marriage, death, divorce, adoption, in order to be able to direct their investments to the populations that need it most and to advance key development goals. Indeed, civil registration and vital statistics systems are essential to achieving and monitoring progress against 67 of the Sustainable Development Goal targets and are directly related to achieving 12 of those 17 goals. We have these, this tremendous agenda for sustainable development in front of us, but we will not know whether we're making any progress or whether we've achieved our targets if we can't count who is being le currently left behind. Furthermore, the systems need to work equitably for everyone. Why are the deaths of men registered more than the deaths of women? This is the case in many countries and historically even here in Canada. In Morocco, uh, it was found that still 65% of male deaths were reported in comparison to only 35% of, de of female deaths. Pourquoi est-ce important? Why is this important? When a death is not 
registered, that means that that person is legally alive. That hinders the surviving uh, spouse to claim inheritance or to remarry. Many women throughout the world live deprived from their uh, own for what from their belongings and they have to go through poverty because a vital event the death of the spouse has not been registered today we live in a world where people are moving constantly refugees as Miriam on those who are displaced by war or natural catastrophe face particular challenges where they cannot register vital events in their life. They can become stateless, their children invisible legally, their marriages not recognized. There's a lot to do to um, count, register, and tally uh, the vitals of refugees, of women, men, and children. Registration and vital statistics agenda over the past two years. And many of you have been working quite hard since that landmark conference here at ID in, in 2018. IDRC, the International Development Research Center, which houses the Center of Excellence for CRVS Systems, is proud to be a part of this global movement with all of you to make CRVS Systems gender responsive and to ensure that CRVS systems can live up to their potential to help us meet not only our gender equality goals, but to help us achieve the SDGs. Thanks to the work that many of you are doing, I would say all of you are doing, we have a better understanding today of the intersection between the issues of gender and how that's playing out in CRVS systems and the challenges to making sure that CRVS systems are more um, able to, make the, to meet the needs of everyone and to recognize those gender differences, make sure that women are counted equally as men. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the hard work of our co-organizers, the United Nations Population Fund um, and Open Data Watch. Uh, who um, are working not only together with us on this wider agenda, but are helping make this event possible today. I'm pleased to present uh, together as well with Open Data Watch, we have successfully published the first of its kind knowledge brief series on gender and civil registration and vital statistics systems. I'm pleased to present the third and final brief at this event. Do I have it? Can I show it? Does someone have it? Aling, or Aling. So we have the third uh, brief that is now available online, and I encourage you to uh, look at it, and hopefully there will be more information about that. I have this mention here. Show the brief. Um, and so we're very pleased to have produced that with Open Data Watch, so thank you. I'm pleased uh, also uh, to also and I have to underscore that this document is in French uh, as well. The, this version is not ready but would be accessible as of March. Pioneered new research in the field. We focused on issues that have long been identified as critical, yet have never been addressed, at least not from a research perspective, such as the root causes and consequences of women's vital events being under registered. So it's all very good to recognize that we have this difference in data capture from women. What's behind that? It's not sim as simple to just say, oh, well, we'll just count them. What's behind that? The findings of this work that we're doing with UNFPA will help to be used to pilot projects in some of the remote places and more difficult contexts to try and really make a difference where these um, gender differences in terms of vital statistics capture are so uh, significant. Avec Affaires Mondiales Canada, nous avons créé le Centre d'excellence pour les systèmes. With uh, um Global Affairs of Canada, we have uh, uh, the uh, we have worked on CRVS 
Yes, I had forgotten the acronyms in French. So registration and uh, statistics. These two words are important to facilitate access uh, to technical assistance, uh, to standards and tools, uh, as well as to uh, best practices. All this will lead to the works of uh, world f financing, and this is the reason of our presence here today. You will certainly hear Mr. Benoit Calassé, that is a director uh, of uh, uh, the technical division of the UN Fund, and uh, he works also with uh, the uh, Mr. Joshua Talasa, that's director general of uh, health and nutrition, and uh, global affairs, and uh, we will talk about statistics. It's been two years since uh, we have gathered here, and um, it is also a few years before the uh, UN statistics meeting and uh, the meeting on, human, uh, on uh, women in New York. Important commitments that can be carried forward to those commissions. This conference is the first of a series of events that IDRC is planning in this special anniversary year, the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Conference of the Commission, uh, the Beijing Declaration um, from the Commission on the Status of Women, to realize and achieve gender equality, making women count and be counted. It's my real sincere hope that this meeting will do more than just generate ideas, but help move us towards that action. I'll ask two things of you with that goal in mind. First, I encourage everyone in the room to, uh, to think of and identify the work within your organization's mandate that you can move forward. What commitment will you make at the end of this meeting in advancing those gender responsive CRVS systems in countries. Secondly, I ask that you make the most of your time together here, share your knowledge generously, challenge the status quo, challenge ideas, and think beyond your borders and even the borders of this field. How can we get this important issue into a much wider public debate? The recognition of the importance of civil registration and vital statistics as a fundamental platform for achieving the SDGs is part of what we can achieve together. This will allow us to turn knowledge into action and to make a real difference for women and children around the globe. These are important times within the CRVS, the objectives being to leave no one behind. That is accessible for us. We have here a community of people that share this objective, this determination. I am therefore happy. I would be happy to see what we can achieve together. Thank you and have a great conference. Uh, here to also help set the stage of the conference, uh, I'm now pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Benoit Calassa, who is UNFPA's Director, uh, Technical Division, to the podium. Uh, Mr. Calassa will be speaking on behalf of Mr. Dirigi Wardofa, the Executive uh, UNFPA ex Deputy Executive Director and Assistant Secretary General, who in the last minute, unfortunately, was not able to join us in person. So we're very grateful for uh, Mr. Calassa to come and speak on his behalf. Thank you very much, uh, Montassé. Uh, Dominique, merci beaucoup pour... I thank you very much uh, for these inspiring words. And uh, I uh, am afraid that it will be hard to follow and to navigate between your good French and your good uh, English. Uh, of... Uh, my deputy executive director, but also on behalf of uh, the United Nations Population Fund and the colleagues who have been working on this. And of course, I see 
also UNICEF here, and we have been working together on behalf of the United Nations. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking Global Affairs Canada for the support uh, they have been providing to the gender equality agenda of UNEPA and for what we have been working on. I also want to thank IGRC for this partnership that we have seen growing and uh, some colleagues here coming from the field will be speaking about how they are moving the agenda of CRVS uh, on the ground. And of course, I recognizing also our convener, co-convener, Open uh, Data Watch. Let me start by underlining the importance of the CRVS and gender agenda and uh, in the timeless of the important meeting as we mark the 25th anniversary of the Virgin Declaration and Platform for Action. And we know that within the Gender Equality Forum, there will be all the six area, priority area that will be driving. And unless we make visible those who are invisible, that agenda of inequality, uh, addressing inequality will not be uh, achieved. Millions of people are born, married, and, doubt, and die without leaving a trace of their existing if there is no official record. In many parts of the world, civil registration and vital statistics systems are weak and deficient, constrained by impediments that exclude women and girls and other vulnerable people population and subpopulation. Yet, civil registration is fundamental in recognizing an individual personhood and securing one's legal identity. I would like to start this by asking you a few questions on which I will invite you to reflect uh, during the course of these two days. What if those people who are left behind, they live in a remote location where there is no access to civil registration? What if they don't have enough information or means to go to register the birth of their daughter or their marriage or the death of a loved one? What if social norms, gender or family roles, hinder the efforts in registering the vital events or those of their family members? Lastly, what if they are on the move, they live, their lives are disrupted by disaster or they lose their identity documents? And Dominique started our remarks by uh, Miriam, the Syrian young lady, and uh, we know what can happen when people are in the move. And uh, we know today how many people are displaced by conflict or by natural disaster. So let's think about those persons who cannot get access to legal identity. Legal identity is indispensable to live no one behind, as it helps fulfilling basic rights, proving place, date of birth and family, entering in a relationship with a state, claiming legal entitlement and contributing to society by realizing the duties and obligation of a citizen. In this regard, CRVS systems a critical tool for women's empowerment, for their own legal standing and that of their children, and the ability to claim their civil rights. I would like now to just talk about the United Nations Population Fund. We know that, and for those who can remember, November last year, 
we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the ICPD, the International Conference on Population and Development Program of Action, where there was a renewed recognition of the linkages between population, poverty reduction, and sustainable development, and acknowledgments that sustainable development is about putting the right needs and the aspiration of individual human being at the center. Gender sensitive CRVS systems are fundamental for inclusion from birth and throughout the life course. That's what the ICPD has put forward. Nous avons aussi célébré l'année dernière. Last year, we also celebrated the 50th anniversary of the United Nations Population Fund. As an organization, we will continue to support a data collection in countries. And this we will do this through censuses. And for over four decades, we have supported more than 135 different programs in these countries. My people, they, did, they didn't put the French here, so, <laughs> so, so I have to start read and translate, okay, but anyway. <laughs> but census and CRBS are complementary pillars of population data, offering a chance for cross-validation and mutual improvement. More important, while many countries lean heavily on census because the registry system is incomplete, if we look at the trends in Europe and elsewhere, registry data, the potential to provide real-time data and may eclipse the demand for periodic census. But we are far from that promise. And in our garden this week, we will celebrate progress on civilization while taking stock of the vast undercoverage that we need to continue addressing. In line with the CRVS and gender agenda and the call for a decade of action for accelerating the 2030 agenda, next week at the United Nations Statistical Commission, we at UNEPA, we are going to launch the UNEPA Population Data Thematic Fund. This new vehicle offers an integrated implementing architecture to rapidly increase the scale, quality, and use of population data through the coming decades to 2030. It will strengthen national data systems over the course of the two population census that mark the path to 2030, supporting effort to monitor and address the sustainable development goals, targets, and indicators. Uh, here we need to get some math between IDRC and UNAPA in terms of how many indicators uh, related to the SDGs uh, we support. My notes are saying that uh, we have around 105 indicators that require population data uh, for estimates. Uh, but Dominique came up with some other numbers, but it is part of the research, right? <laughs> The future of sustainable development is directly linked to fulfilling, to fulfilling the aspiration of women, girls, adolescents, and youth. Empowering the world's women and its 1.8 billion of young people and unleashing the full potential to contribute to economic and social programs will be instrumental for bringing the vision and the promise of the ICPD end of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to life. And looking up the, uh, to the young representative from the African Union, thinking also of, at the 2063 African Union Agenda, right? So it is not a surprise that we convene here in Canada around CRVS and the Agenda Agenda. As Canada in particular has been a leader in linking CRVS strengthening to just stand, uh, RMN 
CAH agenda. A reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, adolescent, health. But now we are adding nutrition. <laughs> right? Most visibly at part of the contribution to the global financing facility. I think here we need to understand. Uh, five years ago, when uh, the global financing facility was launched, uh, Canada was among the first country to pledge its contribution to the financing facility. And it was very clear that Canada was coming with 100 million to support the RMNCH agenda, its implementation, and support to country, within countries by linking it to CRVS. That was a big signal launched to the world. So being here in Canada at the IDRC with global affairs, for me, it speaks a lot. And I continue pushing this agenda since I sit uh, among the uh, investors group representative uh, representing UNAPA. So I'm looking forward to hear from Global Affairs Canada and IDRC how we keep uh, through the excellent work that IDRC is doing to push and to put this agenda at how do we achieve health outcomes uh, through uh, CRVS and making it more gender sensitive. So on behalf of UNAPA, I would like to join my voice to the Vice President of IDRC to warmly welcome you to this uh, gathering. Uh, Montase mentioned conversation. I think we need to have a conversation. A conversation is that somebody is speaking, we are listening, and we chat the path to move forward. So, Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Et... Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy this meeting. Thank you very much, uh, uh, um, Benoit, for uh, speaking on behalf of the uh, Deputy Executive Director of UNFPA. Uh, now it's with uh, pleasure I invite Joshua Taba, who's the Director General for the Health and Nutrition Division at uh, Global Affairs Canada. Uh, to share some opening remarks. Uh, Mr. Taba joined the Canadian International Development Agency in 2003 and has worked in various roles in multilateral uh, affairs and humanitarian assistance and uh, missions of the Canadian government uh, abroad. He was also previously the Director General for Inclusive Growth, uh, Governance and Innovation. And as, of, as you have heard also, uh, Global Affairs Canada under um, uh, Josh's directorate is also a, a big contributor to the CRVS at, uh, Center of Excellence, as well as for other um, uh, global activities on maternal and child health. Joshua, I'd like to welcome you. I will be speaking in English uh, this morning, but uh, I can always uh, speak to you in French if you need. Uh, thank you, Montasser, Dominique, Benoit, old friends. It's great to be with you here. And uh, welcome to everyone, distinguished guests. It's great to have you here in Ottawa this morning at IDRC in this beautiful facility. Um, it's really great to see so many people in one room who care about CRVS, isn't it? And it's a real opportunity for us to take stock together about what we've achieved in the last two years and then to chart the way forward more importantly. Uh, as many of you know, Canada has championed civil registration and vital statistics for over 10 years. Over the past decade, we've had the privilege of working with many of you on CRVS. Of course, the Center of Excellence here, um, the Global Financing Facility, as Benoit mentioned, the World Health Organization has been an invaluable partner, UNICEF, uh, we've done tons of work together, and many uh, non-governmental organizations who play such a critical role in working with frontline uh, workers in many of our partner countries around the world. CRVS is important to Canada because we know these systems are a fundamental cornerstone for human development, rights, and security. A birth certificate gives access to life-saving vaccines in infancy. It allows us to obtain a passport to travel or a certificate to marry and it allows us to eventually register the births of our own children. My wife and I had a small taste of this ourselves. Two of our children were born when we were on posting overseas uh, in a developing country. 
And so we had to negotiate ourselves a very complex web of institutions to obtain the appropriate documentation for our children. Now, we were able to resolve our, our situation because we had great access and lots of support. But for hundreds of millions of people worldwide, that door remains closed, further marginalizing those who most depend on critical services and social protection. So breaking this vicious cycle is essential to protecting human rights and enhancing access to essential services to empower women and girls and to enable gender equality. And on this last point, advancing gender equality, we know how contingent this is on quality and timely gender data. Many of you know that Canada launched its feminist international assistance policy two years ago in June 2017, and it prioritizes improving disaggregated gender throughout. CRVS is an indispensable part of how this will be achieved. And then building on this policy, last June at the Women Deliver Conference in Vancouver, Prime Minister Trudeau made a historic 10-year commitment to 2030 in support of the health and rights of women and girls. Canada will increase its health funding to reach $1.4 billion annually starting in 2023, with 700 million of this invested in sexual reproductive health and rights. Now, fun functioning CRVS systems are important, are essential for women and girls to be able to access sexual and reproductive health services in their communities, in addition to the other basic services they need. So not to be too direct, but the success of this historic 10-year commitment announced by Prime Minister Trudeau for global health is tied to the success of those in this room on CRVS. As always, we can only progress when we work together. And as part of Canada's feminist approach, we invest in CRVS systems to help rectify the lack of data that is critical to identify gender barriers, to assess the gender gaps, to develop evidence-based and gender-sensitive policies and programs, and of course, to measure progress towards achieving gender equality. Our colleagues here at the Center of Excellence have done a great job of increasing global attention on the linkages between CRVS and gender equality. Those first two publications provide a solid evidence base on the gender impact of existing systems and on the importance of reducing women's barriers to accessing registration and the fundamental need to improve overall gender responsiveness. I first read those uh, policy briefs when they came out and I reread them again over the weekend. They hold up great. They're really valuable resources. I'm excited to read the third one, which Dominique waved virtually for us. <laughs> So we're here today because we want to learn from each other to better strengthen these fundamental systems. We need systems that count everyone and all vital events, systems that can inform government decision making and help policies and programs reach those left furthest behind. And while challenges remain, we now know far more than we did 10 years ago about the barriers that we need to address. We know that strengthening CRVS is much more than just a technical systems issue. Reforms need to be based on gender analysis and the integration of gender considerations to ensure that marginalized regions, communities, and people are consulted, targeted, and then included. Gender responsive CRVS systems overcome additional specific barriers faced by women and girls in accessing registration services, and ultimately they just help improve overall registration rates. Over the past decade, we've worked closely with different partners, as I mentioned. Here's a few notable ones. In 2010 and 11, so 10 years ago now, uh, Canada co-chaired the Commission on Information and Accountability for Women and Children's Health. I'm sure some people here remember that. <laughs> and the first, the very first of the 10 recommendations made by this, com this commission was for countries to take significant steps to strengthen the registration of vital events. That was a real uh, watershed moment, wasn't it? And that, that work really helped kick off action in many countries and it galvanized global commitments in this space. From 2011 to 2016, we focused on supporting the implementation of the recommendations of this commission, including those CRVS reforms in more than 30 countries. We funded the development of the Global CRVS Scaling Up Investment Plan that runs to 2024, which outlines a framework and targets to reach universal registration of vital events by 2030, and it's still relevant today. As Benoit mentioned, we remain a steadfast supporter of the Global Financing Facility. We've now committed $440 million since 2015, with 100 million of this amount dedicated to strengthening CRVS systems in GFF partner countries. And out of the 27 GFF countries that have begun implementation, so far 19 countries have prioritized CRVS in their investment cases. And I am pleased that 13 of these have received funding of approximately $84 million to date to implement the CRVS components of these plans. 
We're working with UNICEF, of course, to improve birth registration in many of our partner countries, dozens of them across Latin America, Africa, Asia. But despite these efforts and those of many, many others, we recognize that more must be done. Too many countries still lack functional CRVS systems. So our task over the next two days is to pick up the pace in expanding the scope and reach of CRVS globally, and in particular in those countries experiencing fragility where so much more is needed. At Global Affairs, we've learned a lot over the years from our extensive engagement in this area. So I'd like to share a few brief insights to spur your discussions. So first, and as we all know, governments at all levels need to be in the driver's seat when developing and strengthening CRVS systems. This includes integrating CRVS into national plans and allocating domestic resources to these efforts. As with the GFF investment cases, when partner countries prioritize CRVS implementation, progress and support follows. In addition to prioritizing CRVS generally, countries need to ensure these systems are gender responsive, to reduce barriers, improve health equity, and to make sure the systems work. Second, we need to ensure gender responsive CRVS systems are interoperable with other systems at both a national and subnational level. The full value of data from civil registries is only realized when this data is integrated into other government systems with statistical institutions, population registers, national ID systems, voter registration systems, census information has been well mentioned. Third, the health sector can play an important role to increase birth notification and registration rates. We've had success improving these rates when these initiatives were integrated alongside other specific health interventions, such as immunizations or nutrition support, integrated management of neonatal and childhood illness, and integrated community case management. Fourth, coordination across statistics, justice, education, health ministries is critical for success. Government partners have a clear role to play in enabling this level of coordination. And in our experience, where this has worked well also, non-government partners have also broken down silos within their own organizations, working more horizontally between health units, child protection teams, WASH, education units, etc., and plugging into their existing networks with different ministries to support this. Fifth, advocacy and awareness raising activities are vital. So many of these initiatives target poor women and adolescent girls, increasing their understanding of the importance of registering vital events. To foster demand within local communities to register and eventually increase birth registration rates also means conveying at a community, subnational, and national level that everyone matters. So activities aimed at raising awareness, including of men and boys and community leaders, also need to be integrated to really address power dynamics that create barriers to access. With a view to ultimately ensuring that everyone understands the benefits of registering not only all births, but all vital events. And finally, we found that performance-based approaches can help shift incentives in a positive direction. When birth notification and registration are included in the suite of indicators measuring the performance of local and regional health facilities, rates in these areas have increased. Indicators on the registration of deaths, marriages, divorces, even adoptions could also be included in these approaches. By placing individuals, their needs, and their families at the center of our work, and ensuring that more and more people are visible through CRBS systems, we are all working to leave no one behind. So putting ideas into action to facilitate this by strengthening the technical systems and integrating gender considerations, by fostering political will, addressing barriers and mobilizing funding. This is why you are all here for this conference in Ottawa in February <laughs> with a huge snowstorm in the forecast for tomorrow and Thursday. So that makes you a truly dedicated group of experts. Now, many of you participated in the first conference here in February 2018, and I heard great things about that event. But let's realize it does make this conference a sequel, and we all know the challenge that faces sequels. So joking aside, I'm confident that this sequel will not only live up to the level of the first one, but it may even meet the expectations we have set for ourselves to find and advance new solutions to these complex challenges. So thank you very much, and good luck and good energy in your deliberations.